So I guess we'll start. I know there's just a couple more wandering in. Uh, and uh, we are in the eschatological teaching of the Gospels. Today it's John, and then that'll finish the Gospels, of course. So we'll uh, go into Acts at the end of this uh, session. So um, just a little review. We've talked about Matthew. He presents Jesus as Messiah and King. And then it's written to present Christ to the Jews. That's the primary emphasis. And you'll note the date, A.D. 50. I'm thinking uh, it's the first one written. And, uh, and then Luke uh, is next, writing about 57, 58, when Paul is in prison in Caesarea. He presents Jesus as the perfect man as well as Messiah. It's written to present Christ to the Greeks. The church is becoming largely Greek at this point. Then we go to Mark, uh, A.D. 65 to 63. I still have that wrong. I, that's not right. It's got to be 68. Okay, so it's A.D. 65 to 68. I'm going to have to somehow remember to change that. I don't know. Uh, okay, so presents Christ as the mighty servant as well as Messiah. And it presents Christ to the Roman world, likely written from Rome. Uh, and there's Latin terms in Mark, and that's why we have those ideas. And then John, written uh, A.D. 85 to 90, somewhere in that time frame, written to present Christ as the Son of God as well as Messiah. It is the universal gospel emphasizing the deity and love of Christ. All right, so that's where we're at. We're in John right now. We're going to start with John 6, 39 to 44. And as we've been doing the last while, we're going to put the text on the screen and then We'll work our way through the notes <clears throat> just by, you, know, you can follow along on the page and I'll discuss them. And, you know, we are, uh, uh, with all of the circumstances, I saw we had quite a few late arrivals today. I won't mention any names, but among them were some of my uh, most frequent contributors to the discussion. I was a little worried because Rob is up in Courtney and I was thinking, boy, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to have to get everybody else to jump in there, but Lee, you're here, so I'm glad. And we'll need, we'll need uh, there's several others of you who do contribute, but if you're not one, I want to encourage you to be a part of the discussion. It's, if you have questions, just uh, don't assume somebody else will ask it for you. All right, so here we are, John 6, 39 to 44. And I will say, I guess I should say before we get into this, in the rest of the ones in John, these are just brief uh, uh, mentions of eschatological topics. They're not real in-depth um, discussion. So we're just picking up on a word or two in each of these uh, portions, and I think the part in John will go fairly quickly. But I've, I've been wrong about that before too. So this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me I lose nothing, and but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Therefore the Jews were grumbling about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will rise him up on the last day. All right. Now, so just brief notes on this. I have three points under this passage in the notes. So this passage assures the resurrection of the believers. And here, Jesus himself will do the raising. Now, other passages will ascribe it to the Father and to the Spirit. The, of course, the Trinity is involved. All right? the, God in his three persons. And, uh, and unbelievers, the resurrection of unbelievers, are not in discussion in this passage. So the key words here, here are uh, that Everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. I myself will raise him up on the last day. That's verse 40. And again, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. All right, so it's that reassurance of the resurrection for those who believe in the Lord Jesus. All right, any questions on that one? I think it's fairly straightforward, but there might be something there that causes you to have a question. Anybody have something? All right, ready to move? 
Okay, so let's move on. Uh, as I said, John's gospel here, they're just brief mentions. And, and again, we're going to, and here we're going to be talking about the resurrection again in John 11. Of course, this is the resurrection of Lazarus. So resurrection is the big theme of that chapter. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? So, uh, the comments here, again, just a couple of brief notes. The believer in the Lord Jesus Christ cannot lose. If he dies in the faith, he will surely be raised to eternal life. If he is a living believer, when Christ comes, he will never die at all. Uh, let's see. Uh, and that's the interpretation given in verse 26. Notice that. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Now this applies... To those, uh, let's, I mean, I should back up and read that whole statement. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Okay? So that covers every believer who has died in the Lord from the time of the first believers in Jerusalem until now. All right? So that is covered there. And then he says, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Now, he, he could be making a general statement, but the interpretation we're given in here in our notes, and I agree with this, if he is a living believer when Christ comes, he will never die at all because of the rapture. Right? And so I think this is sort of an, an oblique reference to the rapture. It's not a direct reference, and that's an interpretation I'm putting on the text. You see how I'm doing that? Okay, so that's one of the things in Bible study. We do approach these scriptures with our understanding of other scriptures. And one of the problem, I guess one problem that we have, sometimes we'll see a text like this and might use it to prove our point, but it doesn't prove our point. Our point is, fits. Our point fits in with this scripture. Our point about the rapture. Okay, it fits in with this. It's, this verse doesn't prove it. You see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Okay. Are there two or three witnesses? Yeah. That's right. That's one other thing. And so the scriptures all play into each other. All right, Cal, do you want to add something there? You saw? Yeah. Right. Yes, You're, that's, that's correct. It could apply there as well. That's right. Those who are alive when he returns, that's right. And the second glorious coming, yes. That's true. And uh, so anyway, but I, I just find the language quite interesting because he makes it very clear. Those, he will, even if he dies, he'll live. But then he who lives, it seems like he's making a contrast. And so uh, I want to you know, jump that in there. All right, so let's move on to the next one. John 14 Verses 1 through 3, <clears throat> Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now this is one of those passages that, you know, we all know it in the King James. There are many mansions. In my Father's house are many mansions, right? That's much more, um, how should we put it, uh, romantic than dwelling places. <laughs> right? I mean, we like that word. And I think it comes, I think it, the King James is influenced by the Latin there, I believe. But in any case, uh, you, something is diff different is conveyed to our mind by mansions than dwelling places. Uh, and so uh, perhaps it's, it's, uh, it hinders our understanding think of it that way. But uh, anyway, uh, let's see. So here's my notes. The Lord just announced that he was departing and they could not follow and that Simon would deny him. And so they're all troubled. If you go back and look at chapter 13, John chapter 13, you'll see that. And they're saying, oh no, that'll never happen. I won't leave you. I won't deny you. I'll follow you. Don't." And he says, do not let your heart be troubled. 
That's the context of him saying that. So believe in God, believe also in me. Then he says, uh, his, his answers are reassurances for their troubled hearts. First, he calls them to trust both the Father and himself. In the Father's house, that's a reference to heaven, are many dwelling places, i.e., that is, much room for all believers. And the Lord's departure has the purpose of preparing a place for us in the Father's house. So, uh, what is it, he says, I, uh, what is it that he's going to do? It's not, I, I go to prepare a place for you. Well, what is he doing? Is he going to, you know, is like hammer and nails and building all these mansions? Is that what he's been doing for 2,000 years? Well, hardly. That's not the point. The Lord's actions are preparations for this event. So the death, burial, and resurrection are the first step in preparing uh, for, uh, for preparing that place in heaven. And then the ascension into glory is another step. And the intercession in heaven today is another step. The Lord uh, intercedes in heaven as we're taught in other scriptures. And the final step is return for the saints in the air. So that is the rapture. Again, we'll run and bring that in. And then, of course, the other events that come. They're all steps in preparing for that dwelling place of the saints with God forever uh, in heaven. So if Christ should go and prepare a place for us, he says, I will come again. Now, even though that's a conditional statement, and it's not even a first-class condition, it is a, uh, I think it's third class. So uh, the first-class conditions are ones that either assume that what he's saying is true, uh, and, uh, or, 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 at least, or is even a statement of something that actually is true. All right. So if I go and prepare a place for you, however... I was looking in one of my grammars about this. He said that even sometimes a third-class conditional statement such as this is, is given, and he cites this example specifically, is given about something about which the events are certain. So it's a conditional statement. We sort of think, well, if I go and prepare, well, are you going or not? Well, he really is going, and he did go, and he says, and he really will come again. These are certain things. But it's just stated here as a conditional statement. The verb is called a futuristic present. Uh, let's see. Uh, I am coming again. I will come again is how it's translated. But it's actually present. Okay, I am coming again. So this certainly makes it sound imminent. Could be at any moment, I am coming again, and I will take you unto myself. His presence should be our goal. All right? I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He does not warn us here of any tribulation period or tell us of anything which must precede his coming for us. Uh, so th this is, this is, an argu this is uh, cited or, or mentioned, this is from Custer's notes again, that... Uh, uh, it's sort of an argument from silence. It's not, again, this isn't proof, but we believe that the next, as we talked about last time, the next thing to happen is the rapture. Okay, uh, there's there's no signs, there's no events that are prophesied to that will occur before that event happens. His coming for us remains the expectation of the church. Okay, any comments or questions on this on this statement? All right, everybody good with that? I'll move on to the next, John 16, 13. Again, just, just brief little allusions in John to end time things. So verse 13, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And here's the eschatological reference. And he will disclose to you what is to come. So, and the Holy Spirit will declare to the apostles the things that are coming. Uh, this is pre, a pre-authentication of New Testament prophecy. All right? So Jesus is saying that the Holy, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to guide you and teach you in the truth. And, and uh, I'm not sure if this is where he says uh, he will aid their memory. It's, it's in this passage anyway, I believe he says that he'll recall to the, you the things that I've taught you. And so the fruit of that um, ministry of the Holy Spirit is the New Testament. 
But then that last phrase there in this verse says, he will disclose to you what is to come. In other words, there, are, there is new revelation coming through the Holy Spirit. And, and some of that that is coming to the apostles through the Holy Spirit are the things that are to come. And we see them, that scattered throughout the Gospels. Of course, we're going to see it throughout all of the Acts and the Epistles. And of course, very much in the book of Revelation. The Holy Spirit is going to reveal this to the apostles in that way. I'm just going to go to the next one, which I'll have on the same screen, in John 17, 24, and then I'll take comments or questions on both of these. Father, I desire that they also... This is, by the way, the Lord's Prayer, the Lord's High Priestly Prayer, it's called. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. So here Christ is praying that his people may be with him where he is so that they may behold his glory. In other words, the glory that he laid aside during the period of his earthly ministry. And I've given the notes there, the reference to Revelation 2, 6 through 11, Revelation, Philippians 2, 6 through 11, where uh, it talks about the, he emptied himself and he uh, took on himself the form of a servant, and he became fashioned like a man, and he humbled himself even to death, and so forth, so on and so forth. And so we, we see him in the Gospels as a man, and, he, and he's an ordinary man, except that he can do these extraordinary miracles. But in appearance, for the most part, except the transfiguration, he is one who is uh, like a normal man. But then, the other reference is Revelation 1, 12, where John says, he hears this voice behind him, and he turns to see. You read that description. There is a figure there. He is man-like, but he's unlike any other man you've ever seen in your life. And some of the things that are described there are clearly symbolic. I think it speaks about a sword coming out of his mouth. Well, that is uh, clearly a symbol. It's got to be a symbol. But the brilliance of his appearance and so forth, as John describes it, uh, it conveys his glory. Well, uh, in the notes here, uh, this is Custer's comment, this is a final blessedness beyond all imagination. One of the great uh, things about our, our destiny in heaven is to see our Lord Jesus in all his glory. I mean, we will recognize him. I believe we will recognize him. I don't think he'll be, we can miss him. Uh, he will be the attention of us all for eternity, and uh, it will be tremendous. So this is something that he prayed for, and since he is the Son of God, it will happen. All right? Okay, on these two, ver- uh, John sixteen thirteen or John seventeen twenty four. any comments or questions? Cal? Okay. Yes. Well, he's going to t- not not totally. Everything that he that he Jesus uh, had taught, the Holy Spirit was going to bring back to their minds. He says that elsewhere in the passage. Uh, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. Usually, what that refers to is those things that he is instructed. <coughs> To speak from the Father about the Son is what he will speak. And then, he's, and then that last phrase is the one for this study is the important one because we're talking about prophesy, prophecy. He will disclose to you what is to come. So uh, there were certain things Jesus hadn't taught them. That's right, yes, yes. Right, right. Well, the Holy Spirit speaks to us through what the apostles have written, uh, but it's the, the direct communication here. I think the reference here is, is especially to the, to the apostles and their teaching of the church for the ages to come. Yes, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's, that's a good question because uh, I, I suppose people can take that and say, okay, well, the Holy Spirit told me, and you know, as people do. Okay. All right, any other comments or questions? Okay, I think uh, we're moving along. How are we doing here? Okay. Well, we might. I was guessing about how far to, how far we would get today, and uh, hopefully, this is the last one in in John, John eighteen thirty three to thirty eight, uh, and this is the 
the trial before Pilate. Therefore Pilate entered in again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests delivered me, you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting, so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. All right, so this is the last time Jesus mentions the kingdom of God, or the kingdom, in the Gospels. Now, the synoptics record the question and answer in verse 37. And you'll notice there where it says, you, uh, it's translated here, you say correctly that I am, ask, uh, that I am a king. You notice that correctly uh, is in italics. And I'm not quite sure how the King James says it here. I think it might be, it says, thou sayest. Okay, so th that's translating a, an idiom. Uh, when they, they say that, the, you say it. Okay, they're, they're saying yes. Okay, it's an idiomatic expression. So that's why the New American puts the word correctly. You say correctly that I am a king. So he's responding idiomatically, yes, I am the king. Okay, so, uh, so that's just to clarify what we're talking about here. Now, Jesus, uh, John, verses 33 to 36, is extra material that is not included in the in the synoptics, this little bit of conversation that uh, they didn't record, but John does. Now Jesus, in this, tests Pilate to see if he has a personal interest in the question. Are you saying this of your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Okay, Or is he merely clarifying the charges of the Jews against him? All right, so that's, that's what Jesus is probing. Now, Pilate's indignance in verse 35 shows that he has no personal interest in the question. So then Jesus answers to clarify the charges. And so what he's asking, answering then, verse 36, is he is not setting up a kingdom the way other men set up kingdoms. It is a spiritual, not a political kingdom. All right, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting. All right, so, and I guarantee you, if the Lord had come that way, his servants would have won. Pilate wouldn't be standing there. He would be groveling, right? That would be, you know, that would be the end of it, all right? And it will happen one day. But that's right. So, so his kingdom is not of this world, not of this realm. His kingdom comes from outside this world. Is not taken by force, uh, by force, by strength of human arms. We know from other scripture that his kingdom awaits future fulfillment, but Jesus doesn't explain this to Pilate. He's not teaching. He's not explaining to Pilate, "My kingdom is going to come eventually." All right. Nevertheless, Jesus is still a king, one who bears witness to the truth to reveal God to the world. Though Christ is Himself truth, the world cannot understand it. So Pilate turns from Him in unbelief. So that's this passage. But it does give us a little bit of insight into the kingdom. There is this spiritual aspect of the kingdom. The kingdom is not a political kingdom. Uh, he, is not, uh, he didn't come to set up a political kingdom, uh, at least not at this time. All right. So any comments or questions, that I, things that I haven't made clear? All right. They're all doing very well today. Now, the eschatological teaching of Acts. Acts is written about the year 61. Early in Paul's imprisonment in Rome is when it's in, uh, concluded. So Luke wrote Acts to give the history of the spread of the early church, and it shows that eschatology was an integral part of the apostles' teaching. So we're going to see that as we work our way through. All right, so Acts 1, 6 through 11 is the first passage that we're going to look at. So, when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? So, this is perennial with the Jews. They're always thinking about this. We'll explain that in just a minute. 
He said to them, It is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. After he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. As they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Quite a dramatic passage. So let's work our way through. The disciples ask, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom? So notice the notes here. The Old Testament frequently mentioned the outpouring of the Spirit in connection with the kingdom. And there's some references there. It's probably not comprehensive, but you can look that up. There's, there are references to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then you see a description of the blessed period of the kingdom. And so the expectation of the disciples was natural, since they do not yet understand God's plan to delay the millennial kingdom. So they're saying, well, hey, you're raised from the dead, and you know, it must be the Holy Spirit next, and then kingdom, right? No, no, not just yet. Okay, so uh, here's the point. Now this one, I think this is a very strong argument, actually. If Israel is never to receive a renewed kingdom, now is the time for Christ to clear up their misconceptions. All right, so is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, you, you don't have that right. It, it's going to be a spiritual kingdom. It's not going to be a physical kingdom. This is the time, right, to clear this up. Look what he says. It is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. So the Lord does not discard the idea of the millennial or the messianic kingdom. He just tells them that the time is none of their business. Okay? The disciples had work to do before the kingdom in this aspect could come. And so we have here, you will receive power and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the uttermost part of the earth. And so there is a, a mission. They're given that mission. And he reminds them, you have work to do. He says, the times are not yours. You don't get to know those. All right? And so then, after the ascension, the angels told them, this same Jesus shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. All right? And uh, I'm quoting there the King James. Uh, he will come personally and bodily. He'll come the same way he departed, in the air, in the sight of his disciples. The assurance, this assurance filled them with joy, so they set about the task the Lord set for them while waiting for his return for them. So as we see them leaving the Mount of Olives and going back to Jerusalem, he's departed, and it's a sad thing in a certain way. They have such a relationship with him, but they have these assurances from him and from the messengers, the angels. And you know they're, and they're anticipating what comes next. It's quite a transformation from the day after the crucifixion. They are now, this is the ascension, and they have a greater, far greater understanding now of what was going on and what was about to happen. All right, any questions on this passage? Epochs, yes, that's quite, a, that's quite a word. You know, sometimes translators make these choices, and you think, what in the world? Why did they choose that word? <laughs> it's not, it certainly is English. It's just a little bit of a weird word. All right. Okay, so Acts 2 is our next one. This is this one. Let's see. I think it's this one. Yes, this one might get more questions. I'm sort of anticipating here. Okay. Pa oh, pardon me. Oh, Gigi, sorry. Sure, yeah. Yes. 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 So that means that the time we die, we need not necessarily wait for the resurrection. That's right. That's, that we can enjoy or behold the glory of God. That's correct. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Those who die, uh, those who die 
Well, the indication from the other passages of the Scripture uh, are that they are in torment. So, all right. Uh, but it's, um, you know, we'll come to some of those passages. Absent from the body and present from the, with the Lord is 2 Corinthians 5. And we'll, we'll uh, come to that uh, uh, eventually. But yes, that's, that is correct. All right, so Acts chapter 2, uh, 16 to 21 then. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be that in the last days God says that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, will be saved. All right, so this is the prophet Joel. So Peter quotes the prophecy of Joel. Interpreters vary on their understanding of Peter's use of Joel. So did Peter mean to say Pentecost completely fulfills Joel's prophecy? All right, so he's, you see all these things in his prophecy. So if yes, then why were there no signs in heaven? This is the problem that people, interpreters, wrestle with. That's why there's a difference of opinion. And so there's actually, there are several different ways to view this. I actually, I think I have four of them okay, listed here. So number one, some say Pentecost completely fulfills Joel, but then it, it can't be meant literally. In other words, there were no signs in heaven, blood, fire, vapor of smoke. Sun wasn't turned to darkness, the moon to blood. That didn't happen on Pentecost. So you have to, if, if, if Joel is completely fulfilled by Pentecost, then it can't be fulfilled literally. You follow what I'm saying there? That's the one view. Okay. All right. Second view. Some say Pentecost is only partially, uh, partially fulfills Joel. So... Uh, Acts 2, 17 to 18, okay, the pouring forth of my spirit refers to Pentecost. Verses 19 to 21, the signs in the heaven and so forth, refer to a later period. And so you'll see here, uh, Ironside, Harry Ironside, and I think Hodges, I think that's Zane Hodges, uh, take it that way. Okay, partial fulfillment. The first bit was fulfilled at Pentecost, second bit is future. Okay. Some say the fulfillment of the prophecy began at Pentecost. So inaugurating the age of the king, so to speak, with the full realization of the prophecy to come later. So this is the view of Dr. Custer in his notes. And uh, looks like F.F. F. Bruce and then Robert Saucy is another. So Pentecost was part of the last days from the point of view of Joel, but there will be a much greater fulfillment in the future. So that's Acts 2, 19-20. The tribulation period will have many signs and many people saved. And again, Acts uh, 21, this is what it's referring to, uh, 221. All right, and finally, uh, the final position, Joel is quoted as an analogy, not to show that Pentecost fulfills the prophecy, but that Pentecost is like, is a like event because of the outpouring of the Spirit. And this is Constable's position and Ryrie's position. So what they're saying is that this isn't, Pentecost is not a fulfillment of Joel. But Joel, the prophecy of Joel, is, is quoted as an analogy, analogous, like to. Notice it says, this is what was spoken of through the prophet. So this, is, this event is the same kind of thing, is the interpretation. All right, so how to solve this? We've got four different views here. Which is the best? So view three and view four are the most satisfying to me. Okay, I sort of like points of both of them, but they're not both true. <laughs> That's the problem. Okay, And there are strengths to each one of those positions. However, neither of these views completely answers my own questions. So, conclusion. Serious conservative scholars work to come to an understanding of the prophecy, so I am satisfied that they are getting at the proper interpretation and are close enough to maintain a literal view of interpreting prophecy. So I'm not absolutely certain how Paul Peter is using Joel here. 
I think it's something like either view 3 or view 4. But I haven't really been able to come to a place where I'm completely satisfied to say, yes, this must be the view on this passage. All right, so questions. Do you understand my four views? Do you, does it make sense to you? Okay, I don't think the ones that say this is completely fulfilled, I don't agree with that one. It's clearly not completely fulfilled. Okay, uh, unless you just abandon literal interpretation. Okay, so I, I don't want to do that. Uh, it's partially fulfilled. Well, uh, I guess you could include that one too, but it's not quite as strong. To me, the, the, ver the, the, the distinction of the third view, it's the inauguration of the fulfillment, is better than saying it's partially fulfilled. Right, Lee. Right. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Right. Like everyone who, who is wanting to take Joel literally, is saying, "Yes, those signs in heaven. Those that's tribulation signs." Like we're all saying, well, "Yeah, yeah, we see that in Revelation, right?" So that's why we are. We're having a little bit of trouble here because Peter's saying, okay, this is what was spoken of. And he quotes the whole thing. Now, if he had just quoted, if he just stopped at the end of verse 18, we, would be, we wouldn't be having this discussion. But then he added the rest of it. And we say, well, wait a minute. What does he mean by that? Why did he include that? And so the um, so your, Bible interpreters are trying to handle that and trying to, they want, especially if you're, if you're, like for people who spiritualize the Bible and, spir and use spiritualized interpretation, really it's no problem at all. They can just make it say whatever they want, right? So it's not a big deal. But if you want to hold to a literal interpretation and, and try to be as literal as possible, and then you see elsewhere in Scripture prophecies of these kinds of signs coming in the future, you say, all right, okay, I see those signs, I see that part as future for sure. So why is he saying it this way? And so that's what we're wrestling with. We're wrestling with understanding why Peter is using it this way. Yes, go ahead. That's right. That's right. And that's basically, that's the second view where... where, where uh, uh, Ironside and Hodges. Okay, part of it, part of it was fulfilled early, and part of it's fulfilled later. It could be. Yes, could be. That could be another. That's part of it. Yes, he could be. Like if you want to follow Ironside's view, it's partially fulfilled now. The first bit. The rest of it is later. And he wants Peter wants to get to verse twenty-one to appeal for salvation. Right. Okay. So that's that's rational. You are rational, Gordon. That's good. <laughs> anyway, anyway, but that, that's you see, see that's 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 a that is a faithful literal interpretation. The question, and and I think I you you could you could argue that that Peter is inclu including the whole quote because he wants the first bit and he wants the last bit, and the other is is uh, just he's just quoting it because it's in pl in its place, right? Okay, so it's a. Uh, the point is, I guess the point is that there is, as I came to this, uh, Custer's view was, in fact, in his notes, because I'm, re I'm, I'm editing his notes, all he had was um, the fulfillment of the prophecy began at Pentecost. He didn't include all the other views. So then I went into Constable and said, wait a minute, I'm not quite sure I've heard that. So I went into Constable and was reading what he said, and he said, okay, there's, there's four views. So I thought, well, in fairness, you have to include all four views because these are all views that are, except for the first one perhaps, are, pro are proposed by um, dispensational, conservative Bible believers. So, you know, there's obviously a disagreement somewhat. It's not a major disagreement. It's not like your salvation is going to hinge on which one of these three views you have, or four views. It's just we're trying to, we're trying to wrestle with understanding the scriptures and our presuppositions about literal interpretation. And so we have to acknowledge this is one of those places that gives us a little bit of a challenge. Okay? As you can see in the various interpretations. Does that make sense? 
Okay, and I think there are reasonable explanations. The one that Gordon offers there just now, that's a reasonable explanation. Some of these others, where it says, well, this is the inauguration, Pentecost is the inauguration, but it's not completely fulfilled yet, that's, that's a reasonable explanation. And it keeps us within the literal framework. And then the, the fourth one, that it's an analogy, not a direct um, uh, sort of proof text. That's a reasonable point of view as well. That's, I guess that's the point that I'm trying to make. But I, I just want you to be clear. Uh, and, it, you know, we're covering the prophetic passages in the New Testament, so we, we can't leave one out like this out because we don't understand it completely. <laughs> All right? All right. Uh, Daryl, okay, I was gonna, I was pulling it out slowly, but anyway, there you go. Fools and children should not see a job half done. Well, that's probably true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. I think that this is one of those passages. Uh, like I can see the arguments of each one of these interpretations and they seem reasonable except there's maybe a little thing well what about this, what about that but I can't personally come to a conclusion and tell you which one I think is absolutely correct that's right it's best understood after it happens and once, once it does happen we will have it figured out so we're struggling away at, at it now all right, so let's move on to the last passage. We have time for it. Acts 3, 19 to 21. Therefore, repent and return. This is the, uh, oh, let's see, this is the sermon after, after the healing of the lame man, right? Therefore, repent and return. I believe that's right. So that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things but which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets uh, from ancient times. So Peter says to the Jews, Therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that the times of refreshing may come. The Jews continued to look for the messianic kingdom. That's the times of refreshing. G Peter says, No one can enjoy the times of refreshing without repentance and acceptance of Jesus as Messiah. So th They're going to have to change their mind about what they've been thinking about Jesus. And then, he says, when the times of refreshing be begin, Jesus will come from the Father, that he may send Jesus, the Christ, appointed for you. Heaven must retain Jesus until the time for restitution of all things uh, comes, but Peter clearly points to an indefinite time of fulfillment in the future. This refers to the millennial reign with its consequent restoration of Israel as well as the whole world. Uh, and the... Last point here, the Messianic Kingdom is a major Old Testament theme, as we've seen. And, uh, oh, there's a missing period there that should be 34, chapter 34, verse 11 to 26 for Ezekiel there in that reference. But anyway, uh, this is a this is, uh, uh, little reference. The period of restoration, it is coming, but you only access it by repentance and faith okay, in the Lord Jesus. All right, any last questions on this passage? All right, so we've rattled through a lot, and we'll continue with Acts next Sunday. Uh, we might finish through the, the prophetic uh, passages in Acts uh, next week, and then it'll be on to the epistles after that. Okay, so let's have a word of prayer as we close. Our Father, we thank you for this time today. We pray for your blessing uh, in uh, understanding these scriptures and these prophecies. And Lord, as we uh, work our way through the New Testament, just thinking about the various little details that it adds to our body of knowledge, Lord, I pray that you'll help us to uh, be looking for the return of our King and to be trusting all the words that you have said to us. In Jesus' name, amen.